دعوتكم فاستجبتم لي فلا تلوموني ولوموا أنفسكم ما أنا بمصرخكم وما أنتم بمصرخي إني كفرت بما أشركتمون من قبل وإن الظالمين لهم عذاب أليم The Imam chose verse 22 from a chapter in the Quran which is on Abraham, the father of monotheism. The chapter, the verse is 22. It's very interesting. The verse says that once this affair of this world, this creation, is settled, that is after the day of judgment, Satan will address people and say, God promised you and he kept his promise. I promised you and obviously I could not keep my promise. The fact that you followed me, the fact that you obeyed me, is your problem. And now you shall pay for following me. It's a very interesting verse. It, it, is, uh, it also uh, raises the issue for those of you who are of mystical leaning as to the role of, of Iblis or Satan in Islamic <laughs> theology. Some people think that he's going to hell. Uh, but some people think that he may not, that God will forgive him because he has performed a very useful test uh, on behalf of God for those who are true believers or not. So without much ado, I will invite all the panelists, first the two distinguished speakers from India, Dr. Sanjay Bhadwaj and Dr. Sayyid Hussain Saharawadi from Pakistan. Look at them going in opposite directions. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on in. Yeah. I would also like to invite the panelists. I think we are one chair short, but that's all right. So we have Professor Vikram Thakur, who is an anthropologist from the University of Delaware, Dr. Nipa Acharya, who is a political scientist from the University of Delaware, Dr. Salim Ali, who is a distinguished professor at the University of Delaware, if you come on the side, and research. Come on in. Rifat Lutfel is a graduate student, a PhD student, and she's from Bangladesh. For those from Bangladesh who are thinking that we forgot about Bangladesh, we have not. Uh, before we begin, I would like to also, do we have anybody seated? I think we need two chairs. We need two chairs. Now, now we, we need two chairs. Okay. Okay. You can use mine, but come on. Okay. I will need a chair when I get a chair. I can go. So until then. Please tell me how you got a chair. He's here today. Come, 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 come. 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 Come, come, uh, a strong supporter of this mosque and this school. He's one of the biggest, uh, shall we say, pillars of the community, of the Islamic community of Delaware. He's been here for more than 40 years. He has supported various institutions, including people to people. Uh, and so, Dr. Salim. Sorry. Thank you. Good evening. Um, just clarification, um, my first name is what the way Muqtada said, Salim, uh, last name is Khan. Whenever Muqtada and I am together, there is always some sort of conflict of that nature. And I try to tell the audience, please call him Professor Muqtada Khan and call me who I am. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, welcome to you all who have taken this time on Saturday evening to be here and listen to uh, very distinguished uh, experts in the field. They will be talking about the history, the challenges, and most likely what we all like to hear would be the hopes and opportunities for the future. Uh, at this point, I would like to mention 
uh, that this particular organization that I have been a member of since it started 40 some years back, uh, Association of Pakistani Physicians of North America, um, they, there are two other organizations very similar, with very similar uh, tasks that they perform, uh, which is me medical missions. And uh, one of them is called API, which is the Indian physicians uh, who are practicing in the US or North America. Then there is also one uh, similar organization of the physician from Bangladesh. I'm so pleased to tell you that together they just made an announcement that there will be a new organization called Sapna. The word Sapna in Urdu or Hindi means dream. I may say dream come true, meaning all the physicians who are in North America and from these three countries, they will join hands together and they will provide medical help in any parts of the Southeast Asia, particularly those three countries. And if there is a crisis, and with crisis always medical help is needed, they will visit those areas and perform uh, their uh, services. This definitely deserves clarity. So my hope is that there are more and more of such efforts of unity that once people living in those conflictual areas, when they see that in other parts of the world, the people from the same background can get along, and not only just get along, tolerance is the lowest level of virtue, that they can be nice and kind to each other, and they can work together in the best interests of the humanity anywhere in, in the world. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, these people, individually, these organizations have also helped in countries like Palestine or Israel or other parts of Middle East, and now uh, they will continue their mission with uh, additional emphasis uh, to these uh, three countries of the subcontinent. Um, I'm going to end my words of welcome by reading my poem, which was published not too long ago in the Association of Pakistani Physicians uh, journal. The earlier you heard uh, Professor Muktadar, uh, the way he uh, explained the verses of the Holy Quran, that the message is somewhat similar that I'm going to say now. The title of my poem is Another Chance. Sometimes in my dreams, I see myself on the day of judgment, standing in front of the kind Lord, along with billions of others from all over the world. These are people of all imaginable races, religions, and colors. At one point, they all say, Dear Lord, we did not do what you wanted us to. We mistreated each other and we killed people in your name. But our Lord, can you please give us another chance? In my dreams, I hear God replying, when you were on the earth, I gave you a lot of chances. Now it is time for final judgment. Those of you who were good to your fellow beings, today you will enter into my paradise. And then, all of a sudden, I wake up. I thank the kind Lord. I am still alive and have another chance to help my fellow human beings. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to lay out the program for you as to how you will proceed. In case those of you who are not familiar with what we're doing today, 
and Naveen, if uh, if this is already streaming, can you also post a link on my wall because some people might be you know, right. Your family is looking. I told them to look at Muktadar's. Uh... Yeah. So 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 some of the university people are going to be looking at my Facebook. So we will be streaming also on my Facebook. Uh, there are three or four things that I want to say. First, I want to give you the context of this this event, how this has happened, especially. Uh, Given the background that the State Department is currently under siege, there is an effort to trim down the size of the State Department. Its budget has been cut uh, significantly, and even several positions are vacant right now. So the State Department is struggling to fulfill its role of diplomacy. And uh, one of the things that the State Department does to, is to conduct exchange programs in which we bring in scholars from all over the world to the U.S. We send scholars to all over the world. You're familiar with several of our exchange programs. Some of them are very famous, uh, such as the Peace Corps and, and the Fulbright programs. So one of the programs that the State Department runs is called SUSI, Study of U.S. Institutes. So they study the U.S. Congress, they study religion and pluralism in America, and one of the institutes is National Security Institute. So the State Department issues competitive grants, and uh, this time, well, the, the University of Delaware consistently wins this grant, and we've been organizing the National Security Institute for several years. Uh, prior to this, from I think from 2010, uh, 2010 to 2012, by Professor Mark Miller, and now I'm the academic director for this year, last year, and next year. Uh, what it does is it brings national security experts from 18 different countries to the United States for six to seven weeks. And they not only really learn about how the United States conceptualizes national security, how we think about it, how we debate it, how we engage it, but how various institutions in the United States participate in defining what is US national security and then implementing it. So we've been going all over the country. We just came back from Texas. We went to San Houston uh, military base, which is one of the biggest US military installations. The city is called Military City. We went to UT Austin. Uh, on, on Wednesday, we are going to West Point. We'll be going to the National Defense University. We went to Annapolis, the DOD, all three digit agencies in Washington we will be visiting. And as part of that, uh, we also are engaging in various programs, such as public engagement programs. We have another one on Monday, for those of you who are interested. We have several speakers. Uh, talking about uh, anti-Americanism in their countries. We will be doing this on Monday at the University of Delaware, the Tuesday after that at Washington College, and so on and so forth. Two of the distinguished speakers that are here are also on this SUSI grant, and they are visiting us. The second thing that I wanted to say before I go further is to provide the context of what we're doing here. So this event is a joint event hosted by the Delaware Council on Global and Muslim Affairs, uh, a, a Muslim, you can call it a think tank or a, a, an organization which is not a 501c3, so we can actually go out there and endorse candidates who are engaged in political process. Uh, if you go to the YouTube video, you can see the elaborate method by which we endorse candidates who are contesting the 2016 elections. We also held one of the most, uh, shall we say, engaging and most widely attended congressional debate right here in the conference hall out there between all the candidates who were running for Congress in 2016. And that's the Delaware Council. And then this is Masjid Isa. Uh, it is one of the most open mosques. You can come here anytime you want. If you want to do a program here, we will provide you the forum. Uh, and we are willing to engage in it. It's very progressive. And it is also both politically engaged and culturally open. So why are we doing this today? And there are people who are telling me that what can this little mosque do where the United Nations fell? The UN could not bring peace between India and Pakistan in 50 years. <laughs> what is the Masjid Isa <laughs> going to do about it? Or for that matter, bring about peace between the Arab-Israeli conflicts. <laughs> Dr. Ronan spoke here last time about the future of Jerusalem. So there are three things that I want to tell you. One thing is that the strength of a democracy is contingent on the strength of his civil society. 
And the strength of any civil society is contingent on two things, a highly informed and a highly engaged citizenship. So if the citizens are not informed, and the citizens are not engaged, then it, you may have elections, but it's not going to be a strong democracy. So the quality of the democracy is based on civil society. And the only way you can have civil society is by having public forums like these. So in our way, when we hold forums like this, when we inform our constituency, those who, from our congregation and the wider community, we are strengthening American civil society and actually defending American democracy. So those of you who are hearing all the rhetoric about Islamophobia, you can tell them now that you are part of a program which was defending American democracy and strengthening America's constitution. The same thing applies to international society. If global citizens are not engaged, not informed, especially in this age of fake news, it is much more important for us to be able to be informed and even distinguish between what is true and what is false. So in this age, it is very important that we remain engaged. For example, we, we have twice the crowd for Jerusalem issue, and we have half the crowd for the Pakistan-India conflict. Let me tell you, this is far more dangerous than the Arab-Israeli conflict. In fact, the Pakistan-India conflict is far more dangerous than even the North Korean issue, because these are two countries which are both nuclear powers. They've already fought four wars. It is a credit to both India and Pakistan that even though they fought four wars, they never fought total wars, that they never bombed their citizens, never bombed the cities, etc. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a dangerous situation with two nuclear powers. There is another major nuclear power there, China, so on and so forth. So in, in a way, we have to recognize that it is incumbent upon all citizens to ensure that we have this, pay the same attention to peace between India and Pakistan that we pay to the Arab-Israeli conflict or to the crisis in North Korea. So I think that we are taking, doing our little bit to raise that awareness. And finally, as Muslims, I want to share a tradition which I shared yesterday in the Friday sermon. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said to his companions, shall I tell you about something that is better than prayer, fasting, and charity. This tradition is remarkable because those three things are three of the five pillars of Islam. Fasting, prayer, and giving the cup and charity. And the Prophet was pointing to something which was even better than that. And when his companion said, what is better than this? And he answered, making peace between two parties, reconciling two parties. So to me, Becoming a peacemaker is one of the most, because it hasn't been articulated as a pillar of Islam, I submit to you as foundation of Islam. To become a peacemaker and not a troublemaker. That's the key. So this is our small way of uh, living our tradition by trying to be peacemakers, not troublemakers. So the, this is how the program is going to go. We have two distinguished speakers from two countries. I will introduce them one after the other. The first speaker is going to be Dr. Sanjay Hathwaj, who is from India, followed by Dr. Sayyid Hussain Sohrawardi, who is from Pakistan. Each one of them is going to speak for 15 minutes. And after that, we have a panel of distinguished respondents who each will speak for five minutes, and then we will open it for discussion, question and answers. I would prefer that we keep it brief so that we can have more questions and more engagement. I know people want to make statements. There's one caveat to everybody. We know that you're, most of you are from India or Pakistan. You don't need to tell us your biographies. I have a website, send it to me, I post it on Facebook, number one. Number two, do not delve upon past because that's not the purpose of this event. We are trying to look forward and we are trying to articulate is there a path to peace between these two countries? When we talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict, you will find out that everybody knows what the solution is, we just don't know how to get there. Everybody knows what the solution is. But in this case, I don't know whether we know what the solution is 
to the India-Pakistan, and how do we get there if we don't know what there is? So can we articulate at least? The third thing that I would also like to say is that be optimistic. Cynicism is not going to help. So try to focus on, on what we can do, and especially for those of you here, what can we as a community do here to engage uh, this issue, to, to, to proliferate this concern, uh, to bring about peace between these two countries. So now I will turn to Dr. Sanjay Bhardwaj. These are all very distinguished people. If I were to just read their bio, they would, it would be time for dinner. <laughs> so I'm going to be very brief, but I do not want you to, to, to shortchange their achievements. So very briefly, Dr. Sanjay Bhardwaj teaches at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. JNU is one of the best universities outside the United States. It has made tremendous contributions to social science, specifically what is called as subaltern studies. Ask me afterwards what it is. Uh, he's also the director of South Asian Studies program. Uh, we are hoping to start a South Asian Studies program at the University of Delaware. Inshallah, with his support, we may be able to do that. His areas of studies are two primarily. He studies relationship between India and Bangladesh, studies India's foreign policy, and increasingly now he's paying attention to the impact of energy on South Asian politics. So without much ado, Dr. Sanjay Bhardwaj. Thank you, uh, Professor Mukhtar Khan, distinguished panelist, Shalim Ali Khan, Salim Maliji, Salim Khanji, <laughs> my co-panelist, Dr. Hushan, distinguished participants, audience, Nabil Bhai, I met him first, first day. When I, met, I came here and the, when we were discussing about that, how, uh, why we don't have a dialogue on India-Pakistan peace process, I said yes, I think if we can do it something beyond the South Asia region, uh, we should go ahead with that. Because what is the biggest problem and challenge with this South Asian region people? I'm meeting pe people here, I'm asking whether you are from Bangladesh or you are from Pakistan or you are from India, because we are one people. We are one people, we cannot distinguish by their faces, by their races, their, their hair, by their body, everything we are. We come from common racial and ethnic backgrounds. We say as common ecological organic system. We say as mountain, rivers. We had witnessed or we have common memory of freedom struggles against the colonial masters. Or you can say in brief that the entire South Asian country's journey is a journey from civilizational spread to sovereign entity. That we have been part of one civilization. We are one people. But we have become the victim of circumstances. We have become the victim of terrible partisan. And that partisan was based totally on flawed concept of nationhood, the two nation theory. What do we understand by two nation theory? Was we advocating, asking for a nation state or, or, or I can say a state or a nation? You see the journey of partisan or demand for Pakistan 
from Alama Mohammad Iqbal. He had a different vision where there were no Bangladesh. Today, uh, that time it was East Bengal. There were no Kashmir. Then another visionary had come, Rahmat Ali. There were no Kashmir. There were no Bengal. Then the original Lahore resolutions was presented. In the original Lahore resolutions also, the word was used co-religious states. So there were no Muslim, no Islamic state was talked in, even a single Islamic state talked in original Lahore resolution. What? Have we done a lot? Do not miss it that the Lahore resolution. Anyway, can you, can you let the speaker speak, that, please? My, my perception, my, uh, my uh, understanding of academic, uh, what I am going. So, this further, when it was partisan, that come to know that 65 million people, 65 percent Muslims had gone with the Pakistan, and 35 percent, 35 million people had remained with India. So it questions itself that whether it was a nation in making or whether a state was in making. My point is simple that the what was the Lahore resolutions, what was made by made to present by Fajrul Haq, my, I'm not going in that detail. You have a perspective, I have a perspective, we had different perspective and this is the background that we have been partisan, we had created two states. So what was the original Lahore resolutions, I do not want to go in that but the, the the, the, the tragedy is that we have been partisan and that terrible partisan is dominating the legacies of legacies of partisan is dominating on India Pakistan relations. There are lack of fair understanding. <coughs> there are lack of fair understanding of nationalism. The nationalism, how it has been interpreted, formulated, either it's a European model, but if you go to South Asia, we have a different perspectives and context of nationalism. That has been evolved, constructed over the years. So, my simple point is, is that that we are the one people had been partisan, divided into three states today. And if you will go and examine the vision of 1947, that had been challenged again and again by partisan of Pakistan in 1971. Until date, there are different, different sentiments and demands taking place. After the partisan, what happened with the, this subcontinent, with these two countries, that two countries are trapped in apologistic behaviors. That we are making, developing excuses that there are power asymmetries in two, two states, in the size, economy, and military. One state has not come out still with the memories of 1971. Another had still struggling with the memories of 1947. There are apprehensions and misinterpretations that had been presented before the people for their political discourse like issues of Indus Water Treaty. That has been most successful example before the world community that we have concluded in 1960, but still, till date, it has been in interpreted that the lower repa lower riparian states can suffer if the upper riparian states takes the any action. And for that, for that, the mistrust and differentiating perceptions taking with, with the size, with the military, with the economy, had been advanced and for to advance this this uh, uh, differentiating threat perception, we have been used 
the discourse of ill-defined territoriality, the ill-defined territorial geography of 1947, and there we use Caspian as a discourse. And we still find in our discourse, the nationalistic discourse of two countries, that the, the partisan of 1947 is unfinished partisan till date. And what is what is happening for to 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 complete that unfinished partisan of nationalistic construct? What we visioned, we were visioning. We are building different. We are taking different approaches, like the balance of power approach, where the countries are going for the military alliances, doing treaties, and inviting extra regional powers to play their roles. Though they are there for their geostrategic or geoeconomic interest, but they are very much involved in our domestic or regional discourse. And for that, we are using for our political benefits or, 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 or balancing or as a balancing act or as a balancing threat. What is further fueling and making problematic? The diverse political system, diverse political system, or you can say structural differences between the two countries. You know the history. I don't want to go in detail how the political system had been evolved in India, become the largest functional democracy. And about Pakistan, you know that the system of subordination is still not functioning very well. The, 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 the institution of democracy has not institutionalized yet. This, these all factors are distancing the two neighbors. What is the approaches are adopted, particularly when I go with the Indian, uh, India, that there are two approaches how to go with Pakistan. How to deal with Pakistan, there is one soft power, soft power approach and one is the hard power approach. In the soft power approach, we use with usually the civil society people here many of them, we are, we are also, I am also a deputy, that we should develop the confidence building measures. We should do confidence building measures. But you see the 70 years of history of India Pakistan, that the confidence building measures were taken between the conflicting parties. Means between two NSAs are going for the peace process. They are the conflicting parties. They are not involving the civil society people. They are not involving professors, journalists, academicians, civil, different segments of the society. Confidence is not making into that. Confidence building measures are taking between the conflicting parties. That two states will come. Now you see that these two conflicting parties, they have the critical interest and, uh, and discourse at their home. They will never come out with the confidence building between the two countries. They will not conclude the peace process. And what is that? the other things had been advocated that there should be more people to people cooperation, cultural cooperation, all that. And there are also discourse that what we can do, leave the high politics aside and go with the low political cooperations like the business, economic, develop the economic interdependencies, we do the develop the market economy. Once the people will come together, two businesses will come together, two economies will come together, interdependencies will, will, will be developed and the, the two society economically and politically will be integrated that the political problem will automatically resolve. That is the one approach, soft power approach has been trying, that had been tried many times, but it, it, it did not come. The second approach had been the hard power approach. Time and again, the state, one state, another state has been used that the deterrence by punishment. We believed in deterrence by punishment that if they are not cooperating, we will deter by punishment, we will have the surgical strikes, we will have the attacks on each other, we will try to resolve by military, we will punish them, another country by use of state actors, by use of non state actors. And this is happening. And the second comes is that denial strategy. Okay, 
if you, they are not coming cooperating with, with us then we should secure our ports military bases naval bases borders by advancing tools and techniques and intelligence services this is the denial strategy had been adopted particularly now india is more believing on this denial technology strategy and deterrence by punishment my submission and uh, so my submission is that what is the way forward in that how do i look that i have four five points that i think these are somehow beyond this understanding one is that we should decolonize colonized our mindsets if you will see the history of india and pakistan had been the victims of narrow nationalism and victims of colonial legacies we were not divided if you go with the history we were not divided by before the colonial masters you go the mughal period you go the sultanat period you go anywhere we have been victim of the the colonialized mindset and we have to come out from that this we have to need to decolonize the mindsets of the people and for that we have to we need to develop a supra national identity among the south asian countries supra national identity where like the european union model to come out second point i feel that what is the where are the problems entire problem you will see that we more believe in resource nationalism resource nationalism this is your territory this is my water this is your i think we should come out from this resource nationalism to resource sharing concepts we should develop the resource sharing approach let the you let let india use the Uh, the transit to, to reach to central asian countries for energy and for uh, transportations to uh, to uh, iran and to uh, to uh, central asian countries let pakistan also have uh, cooperation and coordination and access to bangladesh and nepal and all these countries we should uh, develop and we should share the resources for each other's development third point what i feel that we should develop the confidence building measures but the confidence building measures should be taken between the people and the non civil society levels rather than the conflicting parties and that would minimize the security threats from the non violent non state actors and the threat from terrorism will be reduced and the civil, because who are the finally sufferer is the civil society people and when you will involve the people that the problem of terrorism will be automatically minimized fourth i feel it that it is well truth you can defend it that what type of democracy that i think it is need to institutionalize the institutions of democracy particularly in pakistan because you know that th there is a problem with the institutions of democracy that there is state within state particularly on the issue of india and kashmir i think you need to institutionalize the institutions of uh, democracy we need to and to develop the uh, the subordinate subordination systems when there will be democracy will be institutionalized you see the history whenever the political regimes try to make the peace process that other states act and coup against the civil military civilian governments of pakistan you just see it i'm not these are all well known facts so and last point what i would sub submit that that we, we should involve the extra regional powers the role role of extra regional powers like united states like china but not for their geo strategic interest and geo strategic geo economic calculations they are there for their geo strategic calculations and geo strategic economic calculations if they are coming to develop our civil society democracy and they are really supporting us for to to develop this south asia region and they are really concerned about our nuclear programs and and the threats they should cooperate us but not not in the calculative manners rather in the supportive manners and developmental manners they should have the developmental approach rather than the market driven approach then the two countries will come closer and when the two countries will come closer the south asia will have a different shape all the south asian countries will become 
become the, we, our identity would not be Pakistan and ba uh, Bangladesh and India. We will be one South Asian people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanjay. I don't know whether you know that, but there's a book hidden in that. There's a book hidden in that presentation. You need to extract it. Uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting, at least from an academic perspective, for some of the five recommendations. I wish you would at least spell them out in the policy. Our next speaker is from University of Peshawar in Pakistan. Dr. Sayyid Hussain Shahid Sohrawardi completed his MPhil and PhD from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, where he spent seven years in England. Uh, he is also a visiting professor at the Kamal and Staff College, Quetta, National Institute of Management in Peshawar, National School of Public Policy in Lahore. I mean, you're single-handedly fulfilling all the academic requirements of Pakistan, I think. He's also the head of the Department of International Relations. Uh, and uh, without uh, much ado, before I invite him, I also wanted to share with you that of all the people in the group, the two of the best friends are Sanjay and uh, Hussain. So, come on. for attending the session. Um, um, this subject is very important and very pertinent with the, uh, the circumstances we are going through. Um, war on terror is, war on terror, uh, it started somewhere in Manhattan and it has reached to my country and it is still there. So it's not moving from my country, I wish it will move from, from there as well. Uh, in collaboration, uh, in group, um, are in different groups, we are fighting war on terror, are war with terror, are in trouble on terror, there is some kind of confusion. This war on terror is not coming to an end. Uh, yes, bad news from Pakistan for you, people. because everybody is fighting against each other. Americans are fighting against Pakistan. Indians are there in Afghanistan. Afghanis are there. Iran is collaborating and cooperating with the Taliban. Oh, yes, there is a segment of Taliban who are supported by bad news once again by US. So one way or another, we are fighting against each other. But we are saying that all of us are civilized world fighting against the terrorists. Uh, that is what is happening in that part of the world. And I am belonging to that part of Pakistan. Coming back to India, Pakistan, to Landrum. Ladies and gentlemen, when uh, Richard Nixon reached uh, at Peking Airport in his autobiography, he says that <coughs> Chu Lai was there to receive him. And wonderful statement he gives at that moment. And he says, and I quote, when our hands met, an era ended, and an era started. You can very well understand. Before 1971, China-US relations, and afterwards, till now, picture is completely different. I'll, I'll get back to it later on. Economics is a tool that opens the box of friendly, neighborly contacts. We have a beautiful example in shape of European Union. Till they were not economically entangled with each other, which is 1950s, they were fighting wars. They were quite fed up of it. However, the moment European Union's foundations were laid in 1950s, every country had to surrender part of sovereignty to that organization. This means every country in the European continent that was member of European Union could not remain that perfect, complete, sovereign state. And because of that, they got entangled with each other as far as economics was concerned. So that's a beautiful model that we can see in, in, in Europe. Uh, um, yes, 
India, Pakistan are not having any economic relationship with each other. Oh, till 1965 war between the two countries, 70% of trade was taking place between them. And after 1965 war, this trade came down to 1%. And today, uh, trade is not taking place between the two countries, but negative is going, which means from 0 to minus, it has gone down. What is that? Shadow economy. Hmm. Smuggling is taking place between India and Pakistan. And its amount is $2.5 billion. Smuggling between India and Pakistan. India has got a wonderful border security force, BSF. And uh, Indian scholars say that it is, is BSF stands for now border smuggling force because they are so cooperative with these smugglers. Every kind of Indian product is available in Pakistan. We can get a lot of, we can earn a lot of money from this negative economy, which is called the shadow economy. But we are not doing that. You know why? Because we are the enemies of each other. You know, we have got a common issue that is called the Buller Baraj issue. And when we sit with Indians, we say that, well, Buller Baraj, it's an issue. We need to talk to, we need to talk about that. And they say, yes. Uh, what is that? There is one issue called Tulbul Kinal issue. No, no, it's Buller Baraj. No, no, it's Tulbul Kinal. Here we go. Two countries are not ready even to give a common name to an issue. They both are one and the same. So in the circumstances, <coughs> this means a gulf between India and Pakistan is quite wide. Uh, both arm countries are armed with nuclear weapons. We say Pakistan, we say that we were forced to go nuclear. Had India not detonated its nuclear devices, tested its nuclear devices, we wouldn't have gone for it really. But because India, Pakistan are arch enemies of each other. Pakistan was forced to go nuclear. I had stated it to my colleagues who are sitting in the last line, and I am repeating once again. With this nuclear test by India, India went into a completely negative position. Because before those nuclear tests, India's enemy in the region that was carrying nuclear weapons was one, and that was China. Now it is two. So strategic balance has been very badly disrupted because of uh, uh, South Asia going nuclear. This Cold War between India and Pakistan, it is getting very expensive with the passage of time. Uh, Afghanistan is there, that is uh, the land of which is used vis a vis Pakistan. Uh, yes, so eastern side, India itself, western side, uh, Afghanis, who are there working in collaboration with India. Pakistan is a sandwich between the two. That Pakistan can never afford. So for that matter, you must be having very bad news from, uh, from the US State Department, Pentagon. Pakistan is har harboring few bad boys. Mm. We need to survive. We need to survive, yes. Somebody has to, to take the lead. Uh, I proceed. Uh, directly, uh, I am, I am um, 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 addressing you for the resolution of the problem. Uh, as I stated, economics, uh, free trade is the need of the time. If we get entangled into, a, or into an organization like European Union in South Asia, and South Asia has such kind of an organization, it is called South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, abbreviation of which is SARC. Uh, this would muster a lot of benefits to Pakistanis, to Indians, Bengal, Bangladeshis, Sri Lankans. Yes, Pakistan is having bilateral trade and uh, economic relationship with all these countries minus India. And so is India doing with all these countries minus Pakistan. However, it will benefit us a lot uh, if we get, all of us get together because for different products that we are producing parallel to each other, we are competing for our market. So this means we are competing against our neighbors. Rice, cotton, jute, we are competing against each other. And in this way, the price comes down, of course, when there is competition. Ultimately, the, 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 the sufferers are uh, South Asians. SARC, this organization that I just spoke about, it was formed in 1985. And till now, it is going with such a pace that the trade between the, the countries of SARC members is 
four percent. Ninety-six percent of the, the trade of all these countries is with outside world. That is the dilemma where I want to draw your attention. If we get together, really things will be completely different. Uh, if we remove this uh, non trade, tra trade non tariff uh, barriers, uh, bureaucratic hurdles, things will be completely different between the uh, the, the two countries. Of course, yes, I I accept and and it is quite understandable. India is a much bigger market than Pakistan. But uh, proportionate trade is still possible uh, if the government set the uh, right policies. Automobiles, textiles, uh, several, other, uh, several other sectors, uh, exports, uh, and partnerships can benefit traders from both uh, sides and both countries equally. Ladies and gentlemen, there is another very important point uh, that I am right now uh, the part of, and that is people-to-people -people contact. Uh, both countries discourage uh, uh, the other the, the, the citizens of uh, other countries uh, to visit their country. I have been to India, and when I was in India, everybody was meeting me with such a wonderful uh, uh, attitude. They were embracing me, stating that, oh, it's so nice you have come from across the border. And trust me, so is the case with all Indians who come over to Pakistan. But we are extremely less to visit each other's countries. Can you ima just imagine, Professor Khan said that uh, in the last uh, five weeks, uh, uh, the best friends that he found were me and, uh, uh, and Sanjay. So this means we are having really very good uh, approach towards each other. Uh, visa restrictions are producing more misunderstandings. More people will visit each other, the better they would understand each other. This poisoning and maligning of uh, the attitudes of the people at the hands of media is in fact contributing to, uh, to, to, to having a negative image of each other. That is directly needed. Um, there is another very important thing that I would like to address. Uh, and you have seen a demonstration of it as well, telling the story of partition. Shouldn't we have had enough of maligning others, of teaching our kids of hate? Let's for once uh, work uh, together. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll answer this. We'll get it um, to tell our children what, in fact, was better in this uh, 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 partition, how we had helped each other. You know, Pakistan, 70 years have passed. Pakistan is a reality. We accept it or not. It's a fact now. Let's proceed further then. After all, how long we will beat about the brush, the beat about the bush, and we will just condemn the history. Yes, many things had gone wrong at that very time. Let's proceed. Educationalists, historians from both countries must sit together and work on their narrative, which shows that in an event when all begin to go topsy turvy, people had have their humanity intact and shielded one another from the harm. And there have been numerous such uh, stories that we can talk about. A very important aspect that we ignore. Pakistanis and Indians, they indulge themselves in mostly the same sports and games. Cricket, hockey, football, volleyball, kabaddi, squash, tennis, polo, snooker. Should I go for further? Volleyball. I mean, all these, oh, yes, once again. Bollywood, Bollywood movies. Now, Pakistani actors, actresses, and Indian actors, and they are proceeding for a joint. Uh, so you, what, what is this? List will never end. Our sportsmen have run neck to neck with each other for decades. A Pakistan India contest defines the terms of sport for people all over the world. This is the time when we must permit our sportsmen to visit each other. More games means more understanding, more liking of each other. There must be some space, what, what we call safety wall, that may release the pressure. If no game happens, no contact happens between the two countries, governmental level, forget it. Even at people to people level, what would happen? Pressure will rise. And of course, then there would be narrow nationalism that would ruin them. Uh, very important uh, uh, second last point, and that is we fight common issues and we uh, cry together. Common issues are poverty, uh, uh, empowerment uh, uh, of, uh, 
uh, taking care of women, uh, rape cases in, 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 in India. So are the cases in Pakistan. We need to, these are our issues. We need to get together over these issues so that we may proceed further and develop some kind of uh, 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 a joint front against them. We must stop selling conflict. It's a myth. Pakistan-India war is not just unfeasible, undesirable, improbable, but it is actually economically impossible as well. But we are trying to sell the conflict. I would like to take uh, uh, over this subject any question that you want to pose. I have reached to almost the uh, last part of my, uh, my, 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 my talk. And that is, uh, first of all, we need to identify issue. And then we have to recognize it as well. We are neither identifying issue, nor are we recognizing. We are in a state of delay, one thing. Second thing, isolating a country like Pakistan in the region, it will be detrimental to the interests of all the countries in the region, including India. Pakistan-US relations deteriorated subsequently. Pakistan lost United States. It was not that harmful to Pakistan. For Pakistan, harmful thing was that India-US strategic partnership takes place. US, rather than having an even-handed policy towards South Asian countries, it went for bilateral relationship and it went for the hyphenation of India and Pakistan. Uh, and the last line, which is going to take another 20 seconds, and that is, Pakistan was created in the name of Islam, religion. Not even for a single time, Pakistan has been governed by any religious party. Not even for a single time. And BJP is completing the third term. And the way they speak, they are speaking from the governmental level. From Pakistani science, you see people from religious backgrounds are talking from a non-governmental side, which is not that important. We need to see India is indeed a secular state. And we need to see if Pakistan, which was created in the name of Islam, is behaving uh, uh, the way it is expected to behave. Uh, once again, once again, Richard Nixon, when our hands will meet, an era will end. And then it'll be started. Thank you very much. I can't believe somebody has something nice to say about Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> the common thread seems to be that we need to have cooperation on economic grounds, grounds. Interdependence is the pathway to peace. But it's very interesting. Sanjay demands that Pakistan become democratic. And so he'll want India to be truly secular. It's an interesting argument. Our next speaker is Rifat Lutfu. She is from Bangladesh. She's a graduate student in political science and international relations at the University of Delaware. She is a second year PhD student. Her areas of interest are securitization across South Asia. She's also interested in comparative political economy of developing countries. For those of you who are follow the discipline, you will realize that that's exactly what these two gentlemen were talking about, comparative political economy through interdependence, which will have a direct impact on the security situation. Uh, she did her undergraduation at the University of Dhaka. She got an MA from the University of Akron, and inshallah, PhD very soon from the University of Delaware. introducing me and providing me this opportunity to talk here. I am honored to participate in this symposium. I am from Bangladesh and from my country's perspective, the peaceful relation between India and Pakistan is very important for the stability of the region. We all know that economic and political factors reinforce the relationship between two countries especially the economic factors shape countries' attitude towards each other. As both speakers already mentioned that economic factors diminish the animosity among the states in the European Union. Similarly, in order to establish an economic integration, SART has introduced SAFTA. SAFTA provides an opportunity for the South Asian countries to cooperate among themselves. The success of the SAFTA is a crucial factor for the South Asian countries. 
most of the South Asian countries have been categorized as developing countries with poor economic conditions. So if the SAFTA works out, it will help the South Asian countries to boost up their economies. And the success of the SAFTA can also unify the SARC region, which will ultimately increase the bargaining power of the region. Besides, the SARC members can also grow their confidence on their region. Therefore, they can also address their regional problems and can take proper measures under a cooperative framework. On the other hand, if SAFTA fails, the region would fail to act as a unit because of the lack of cooperation among them. However, it seems like issues resulting from colonial legacies and the security dilemma between India and Pakistan impedes the operationalization of SAFTA. Also, Pakistan's commitment towards making Pakistan as an Islamic state and BJP's commitment towards making India as a Hindu state work as negative factors towards the peace prospects of this region. As a result, the SAFTA also fails to evolve as a competitive regional bloc. These two nuclear powers need to stop opposing each other and increase more effort to establish cooperation under SARC. I have a question to both speakers, Dr. Bhardwaj and Dr. Stewart, is that if the political parties of both countries feed anti-Pakistan and anti-Indian sentiments to its people for the votes, if so, I believe that non-official dialogue between India and Pakistan can educate public opinion. The younger generation of these two countries can lead these non-official dialogues. I think uh, these younger generations are the best hopes because they are more optimistic and more future-oriented. Although it is known that people from India and Pakistan revolve around traditional norms which determine their perceptions. In addition, both countries also offer their own version of selected history in the textbooks. However, I do think younger generation has the potentiality to progress the Indo-Pak relations. The obvious reason is that they did not personally experience the traumas that caused from the previous incidents such as 1947 partition between these two countries. Therefore, this emotional detachment would help would help them to think them out of the box, unlike the older generation of the countries. Also, their perception towards other countries would be more optimistic. So before ending my talk, uh, I would also want to ask a question to Dr. Vardwaj. Like he talked about uh, resource sharing concepts. I think that's a very good point. That's, that's I think, a very helpful uh, point he mentioned. But I'm not sure how how the government will be convinced. Like the government, the current situation seems like the government is not convinced to do this kind of, uh, yeah, to cooperate in this kind of policy. Um, and to conclude this note, I hope this India-Pakistan would manage to establish peaceful relations with each other, which ultimately would help to establish a successful regional bloc. Thank you. Kim is three out of three. Every speaker is saying people-to-people -people relations. I think you need, you need to move to India, Pakistan, yeah. and open one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, having the people-to-people -people seems to be the, the main thing. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Salim Ali. He is a new addition to the University of Delaware. He is our distinguished professor of energy and environment. And he comes with a whole lot of achievement. He's, I think he went to all the Ivy Leagues in the country. <laughs> he went to Yale, he went to MIT, uh, Tufts, etc. And he's also worked overseas. He worked uh, even in Australia. He's back here. Uh, we are very delighted to have him at the University of Delaware. And I hope that today begins his engagement with the community also in Delaware, inshallah. Dr. Salim. Thank you very much, Professor Khan. Um, it's a pleasure. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be on all of you. Um, so I'm going to basically stick to a, a response kind of format rather than giving my own 
uh, speech because the time is short and it would be great to have your comments as well. So uh, I commend both the, the distinguished speakers for their constructive comments, though I must say that they couldn't resist going back to history despite Dr. Khan's earlier invocation, so we spent half the time just talking about history, sadly. Um, but nevertheless, the comments about suggestions were very positive. Uh, but let me just raise some provocations. So one hypothesis that was presented was around institutionalizing democracy. Uh, and I think we have to put in another word in there informed democracy. If we have just this kind of a, uh, a love affair with democracy without having a proper context for information, for knowledge, then democracy can actually be misused in a very perfidious way. Indeed, we have seen that happening within our own country in the United States uh, as well in different ways. I, I don't want to just beat up on the current context. It's happened at other times in US history as well. Uh, so I think informed democracy is important for both India and Pakistan. And I would say, in fact, some of the examples of recent peace between uh, very acrimonious countries have happened not with democracy. So Jordan and Israel, you had the, uh, the presentation on Jerusalem. Uh, that happened when one, one of the players was certainly not a democracy, was a kingdom. Um, in the other case, uh, Egypt and Israel also uh, was a military dictatorship and a democracy, but more in many ways, uh, you know, in the case of Israel, one would say um, very ethnocentric uh, democracy. Um, and, you know, one can raise questions about what it means to be a democracy also in that regard, when demography itself becomes contested, that a country states that you have to have a certain percentage of a certain kind of population in order for you to remain a certain kind of state. And Pakistan has a very similar problem as Israel, actually, I would say, because Israel and Pakistan in, in uh, the 20th century are probably the only two countries, and Bosnia might be another one, which were created specifically on the premise of religion as being the, the context of nationalism. So much as even though Israel and Pakistan might not otherwise have diplomatic relations, they actually have far more in common than they realize. Um, so I would say that in itself has to be Question. And that goes to the point that both speakers made about the role of religion and how religion should be um, operationalized in statecraft. Uh, and, you know, we cannot ignore the fact that Pakistan's identity is very much predicated in religion. And the, the result of partition was de facto India's identity, even though it is a secular state, it became operationalized in religion, and that is why BJP has had so much success. Um, and we cannot ignore that. I mean, if that is the will of the people in India, we cannot ignore that. We, we have to figure out a way to make it a more constructive dynamic. Uh, and, and both Islam and Hinduism have within them elements which can allow for peace building. Um, but you have, I mean, religions are as they are, you know, very expansive in, in, in their, uh, in their uh, repertoire of learning. Uh, and it can be very easy for people to selectively take those elements uh, which can be used for negative nationalism and those which can be used for positive nationalism. So I think I would add to the uh, list of recommendations also the point that we bring in the positive elements of religious education in both India and Pakistan in playing an important role. Because both countries' people are faithful, and we cannot ignore that. I mean, India has a very faithful population of practicing Hindus, and Pakistan has a very faithful population of practicing Muslims, and India has a lot of practicing Muslims as well. Uh, in fact, almost as many Muslims in India as there are in Pakistan. Uh, how can we channel that? And then Bangladesh, similarly, same applies there. Um, one other contestation I might bring about is the role of civil society uh, and the younger generation, which our uh, final speaker brought up. Now, you know, we have to look at the data. Those of, uh, those of us who are in the academy, much as we would want to be inspired by youth, the reality is that, sadly, the data is not supporting that. So, in fact, the younger generation in India and Pakistan is becoming more radicalized. And we are seeing this as a very dangerous trend. 
Uh, there is a recent book by Madiha Afzal, which has been just published by Brookings. Uh, and she has done a detailed survey of, uh, of attitudes towards religion and other factors. Um, and we are finding, in fact, that there is a radicalization phenomenon in both countries among the younger generation. So much as the older generation may be scarred by partition, they are also very much impacted by that bond of friendship which they observed. And my mother is here who, who was born before partition, uh, and you know she remembers the time when she had Hindu neighbors. And uh, you know there's a lot of fondness and affection which comes from that time as well. And that is missing, unfortunately, from the current younger generation, because they have been fed the Bollywood narrative. Uh, they have been fed that kind of very uh, negative uh, approach to the whole conflict. So I think we need to focus on the youth. I agree, we focus on the youth, but let us not be so complacent that somehow the youth will solve the problem. But because in reality, the youth have been miseducated for a long time uh, in, in both countries. If you look at the history textbooks in both countries, you have a very caricatured view of history that's presented. So I will end it there in terms of my provocations. I, I have. I have worked also on the issues of environmental diplomacy both between both countries, uh, and I've also done work on SARC, but I, I don't want to take everyone else's time, so we can maybe bring that up later if needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarimari. I actually tried that a few years ago. <laughs> I wrote an article called Islam, Hinduism, and Peace. Uh, in the context of India, and then you should read the comments from both sides. <laughs> and the fact that I've not attempted it again <laughs> should give you some idea of the commentary that I was receiving. Uh, our next two speakers are actually uh, husband and wife. One is an Indian American, and the other is an Indian in America. <laughs> and the first thing he told me, Vikram, is something that kind of aged me. He said, I've been listening to you since childhood. <laughs> He's been listening to BBC Hindi, and I sometimes I'm on it. So Vikram Thakur is an anthropologist uh, who looks at, he will tell you what he does. Uh, he looks at uh, movements, uh, resistance movements at grassroots level, uh, especially those connected to environment and energy. Uh, but he's also uh, another heavily I'm a lead person, got his PhD at Yale, did his fellowship at Brown, and uh, I'm really happy and proud that the uh, University of Delaware, with lots of people in Wilmington thinking the party school is not, you can see the talent it is attracting. It is, if you Google the word public Ivy, University of Delaware pops up. Uh, so yes, <laughs> now you know why. Because <laughs> for the generous introduction. Um, yes, I am an anthropologist, and um, so uh, like all anthropologists, let me be, be, begin with an anecdote and some caveats. So the first caveat, of course, is that I am an anthropologist. So unlike um, the comparative work that they do at a uh, macro level, uh, we do macro stuff like, oh, a village here, an individual there, and we you know, spin a yarn out of it. So uh, let me begin with a yarn. So when I was a student in New Haven, Connecticut, and we had food carts there, and there was a person, if I see somebody, you know, I've often had the situation once I moved to the US about 11, 12 years back, that a lot of people walk up to me and start speaking to me in Spanish. And um, I, I look around and then I say in chase English, I'm really sorry, but uh, I'm from South Asia. I, I don't speak any. You know, and depending on the person is from Peru or, or um, Bolivia, you actually look very much like a, and you can fill in the blanks. So, um, and, and I do something similar as an anthropologist because I speak fluent Bangla and Urdu, um, the languages, the official languages of both, um, of Bangladesh and, and Pakistan respectively. And, and that's because Urdu is my quasi mother tongue. So, um, Anyway, so I went to a food cart and, and they, these people and, and I used to talk to them in Urdu because that was the only chance I would get to speak um, my quasi mother tongue. And a friend of mine who was an archaeologist said, you must be getting discounts, right? Because you speak their language. I said, you know what? This person is from um, the other side of the border, Punjab. 
but he's, he's from actually they were Sindhis, and I said he has a history of three thousand years of being a business person. He comes from that area, Sindh, of a township. If anything, he'll charge me an extra buck because I speak his language rather than give me a discount. So, um, so. The, the, uh, I'll link that to the economic issue, but anyway, this was my anecdote and the caveat that I'll be working on the mi micro sh issues mostly. So, well, let me look at the bigger picture. So, I grew up in, in central India um, in a town called Nagpur, which is the headquarters of two, three interesting movements. One is the Maoist movements in India against the Indian state. Second is, um, it's the headquarters of the Indian right-wing um, organization called Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, RSS, which dreams of having one big united India at some point which is absorbed Pakistan, Bangladesh, and then some other things as well. And, and so growing up there, I think that's one thing that um, I would like to point out, and I'm, I'm, without taking uh, specific points, I'm of course responding to the points raised by Dr. Bhardwaj as well as Dr. Surya Varthi. First thing is that a lot of India is in denial still now to the fact that Pakistan actually exists and has existed uh, pretty successfully for 65, 70 years and will continue to do that for a long, long time to come. So um, they actually have a map hanging in their headquarters which talks about the undivided India. Well, well, before the British came, India did not exist. I mean, in, we had a lot of kingdoms and, and they were united at different points in time under different empires. So the first part is that you know modern nation states are a very modern entity as we talk about in the last 200 years. They begin with Creole nationalism in South America, moved to Europe in the 18th, 19th centuries, and then moved in the through the process of decolonization. So Pakistan exists, but a lot of Indians are in denial of the fact. So the first step for peace building would be to admit that Pakistan exists. So to talk about that a partition actually happened, and now let's talk as people who are not one entity anymore and then build friendship and friendly relations from that point of view. So that's the first issue. And it also builds up because of the fact that the generational memory of being one people is almost coming to an end. <laughs> the present president of Pakistan, Mamnoon Hussain, uh, was born five or six years before the partition took place. He was actually born in the city which has Taj Mahal, Agra. And, but he is so old, I mean, and, and with that, in a five, in another five, seven, ten years, that idea of partition as a, you know, undivided countries would be a, as a living memory would be gone. And then you would only have people existing on both sides for whom partition is a reality on one hand, and they are produced as nation state subjects who are taught to hate each other. So, and that is a reality we have to deal with. But what can bring peace here, thankfully, is the fact that Indian subcontinent is like European Union in some ways. Europe, let's say, not, not, let's not get into the Union part. It's like a Europe, in fact, in many ways, way more complicated. So, for example, there are many Indians in University of Delaware with whom I, the only common language I have as an Indian is actually a colonial language called English. <laughs> because, um, um, in fact, if I did not speak any Bengali, either with my wife or with Rifat, I would not have any common language other than English. So the point I'm trying to make, India has what, 30 provinces, 25 official languages, so I'm talking about each province of India as having one language, distinct language, food, culture, history, all of that, okay? Similarly, Pakistan has four or five provinces, and each of them have a distinct history. Right. We are just lucky that only three nation states came out of that Indian subcontinent. That's only because you have big, ruthless armed forces on both the sides, both in India and Pakistan, which make sure that other smaller ethnic entities are not able to pull off another country. That's it. Otherwise, at any given point in time, if Pakistan, uh, Pakistani army is fighting one in Northwest Frontier Province, or in Balochistan, Indian Army and Indian paramilitary forces are fighting several in, they have fought one in Punjab, they are fighting one in Kashmir. If you go to Kashmir, it's not very different from Jerusalem where I traveled to in 2015. You have army bunkers on every cor corners and crossings and that's how it is. So that's the second aspect. This is again linked to the denial of the fact that these countries actually exist. 
It's like, no, 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 they don't exist. So that's the second requirement for peace, which is also besides denial is the fact that actually they are not nation states, you have regions that are in place. So for example, in New Haven, Connecticut, there was a shared cricket team where I used to keep scores once in a while. And it was played by Sri Lankans, people from um, all former British colonies, people from the West Indian countries, Jamaica, Barbados, and, and of course, India, Pakistan. Now, the Indians and Pakistanis, they would speak to each other in a shared language, which was Punjabi, which is a province. Because a large part of division which took place between India and Pakistan is across Punjab, East and West Punjab. In fact, part of the failure of that partition was because India and Bangladesh, uh, in, uh, Pakistan, sorry, East and West Pakistan, um, they were divided across religions, but then language came into the issue because Bengalis saw, saw their language as their central identity. So this regionalism also holds the key that people will get together eventually if there's more contacts allowed. And the third and final point to that is if we keep the elites out of the picture who actually profit out of it, so Donald Trump may be a millionaire, but he actually sells populism, and that's exactly what the elite politicians in India do, and, and that's what the elite army officials and politicians in Pakistan do, which is spread a certain kind of hatred. So they may be, and their kid, kin, kid and kin may be sitting here in the US and in England, but to people on the streets, they're selling hatred. And, and that's another problem. I think I'll just stop here and you know, leave the rest for the Q&A. Thanks. <laughs> Our final respondent is uh, Dr. Nipa Acharya. Uh, you should search her on YouTube and see her play the violin. She's, she's sublime at it. I don't know why she is coming into academia <laughs> with, with such tremendous talent at music. Uh, Nipa went to Stanford University. Uh, she also taught at Stanford University. She got her PhD in Belgium. Uh, and she combines political science, a study of international migration, with the also study of entrepreneurship, uh, and increasingly is also looking at South Asian politics, global cities in South Asia, identity and business. So a very complex picture of how uh, cultural identity, business uh, environment, uh, entrepreneurship and politics uh, intersect. Uh, Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank our wonderful speakers today, uh, Professor Syed Hassan, uh, Hussein Sohorwardi and uh, Sanjay K. Bhardwaj for se uh, setting us up right now with uh, some thought-provoking ideas regarding the future of peace between India and Pakistan. It's really a pleasure to be here today at the Tarbiya School and at uh, Masjid Isa. Um, I also wanted to thank our fearless leader here today, uh, Professor Muktadar Khan, who is stalwartly resolute in finding fascinating programming to bring us here in Delaware and around the world. And to all of you, as I'm now a new migrant in Delaware, I've been continually impressed by the character of its residents and uh, by the desire of all of you to think and learn. And now I feel much better about myself, and I think you can all put a pat on your back that we here today are strengthening the civil society uh, in what we're doing based on um, how uh, Professor Khan introduced this presentation. Now I have this duty at the end to sort of put together several of the comments that have been made. I have a few pointers to kind of add to that um, and lead us into hopefully a very, very fascinating discussion. Uh, Dr. Pardlewedge started out with a lot of beautiful points that I had highlighted myself um, in my own, you know, what I had prepared to talk, which is that we are one people. Um, and I have this picture that I brought, and I wanted to show it to you since we've been talking a lot about partition. Uh, this is something I showed to my students at University of Delaware. Uh, this is a picture from 1947 uh, of Pakistan and India. I'll pass it around so you can take a look. This is quite a famous picture. Um, so this is when the books were being divided. Uh, so for, this was the division of books from the National Library. And you can see uh, the man that's there is standing like this. Um, and this has kind of been the theme, I suppose. This has been the theme of not only partition, but I often see in these conversations between India and Pakistan, which is, what do we do? What is going on, right? And in a lot of the discussion that was coming out, this soft power, uh, sorry, the shadow economies. Um, in fact, I have a friend at Brown, Rahul Medhiratta, who's a, a postdoc, who's doing work on the smugglers themselves and having interviews with smugglers in Pakistan that are moving from um, 
from Karachi into, uh, into uh, sailing basically across and smuggling their goods. Uh, and it's funny because oftentimes the discussion is also like this, like we don't even know what's going on. But I think this also is very interesting, right? Because what we see here is despite the BSF, despite all that's going on in the borders, there's a sort of movement of people, no matter what, whether it's in a shadow economy, to move from one place to another to choose that we are one people. Um, I thought that uh, Dr. Pardwaj said something else that was interesting that I often tell students, which is that our goal here is to decolonize our minds. How do we move past this trauma of partition? I do have one uh, kind of contentious resolution with everything everyone's saying, which is the fact that the memory amongst youth uh, has been lost about partition. I myself am coming from a partition family, my father. Um, being born in what was East pa Pakistan at the time. He was born in 1948, so he was from East Bengal, then East Pakistan, and then into uh, Calcutta, into West Bengal. Um, but at this time, especially coming from this partition family myself, I can say that oftentimes, uh, th this year is the 70th anniversary, in fact, of partition. Um, you will see, uh, there's, uh, Rifat and I showed, there was actually a big BBC special on young people talking about how they feel that they can't move past partition, that no matter what, even 70 years later, partition is very much alive. And I think considering that just here there was a Jerusalem talk, oftentimes you hear this in Palestine as well, you know, 70 years of being in a refugee camp, what does that mean? And there's a lot of questions uh, thinking about that. So I do think amongst youth, there is still both a trauma of partition and an understanding of it, but it's morphing in a very different way. Um, and this is where I think something else we could think about when there's been several jokes about cricket or all the sports that we enjoy on both sides. Um, something that I see amongst youth is very much a, a movement of cosmopolitanism. Uh, India is right now a population of 1.324 billion people. Uh, with a Muslim population of 172 million people. That's a massive minority, imagine that, 172 million people. In fact, I mapped that out, and it's basically all of the Middle East subtracting Turkey, if you don't include Turkey. So that's a massive population, even if it's a minority within India, um, as, and as we were saying, an equal balance. Amongst that is a youth population on the rise, both in Pakistan and in India. Um, we'll see that Karachi within, I think, the next 20 years is going to be um, the, the second largest megacity. What we see, though, is a cosmopolitanism that's very different. It's about be becoming part of one world. And that's a discussion that's not new. We can look at the Asian conferences that were happening in 1945, and at that point, uh, at, uh, actually Gandhi and Nehru were both talking about what it means to be part of one world. Um, so these are things that are kind of in the mix that also makes me think of one other thing that wasn't really mentioned in the conversation, which was diaspora. What is the role of diaspora? I bring this up in context to Sark. Uh, Sark was a very interesting conversation that came up that was mentioned several times. I do have a question here, and that's because I just spent 10 years living in the giant bureaucracy known as Brussels, Belgium. Uh, being in the EU, um, there was, is an economic incentive to be part of the EU. But there's also become increased nationalisms as a result of being in the EU. These increased nationalisms has, all, has also, as we've now seen in the past elections, led to much farther moving right-wing parties in every single country that's been pushing that. So it makes me wonder, when we're decolonizing our minds, what, what does it mean to think about EU models? Is this a model that works for India? And here Dr. Bhadwaj mentioned something very interesting, which is that uh, the nationalism in India is very different. The nationalism in South Asia is very different. We're living in a place with very with subnational identities. So even though we are all one people, this fighting, oftentimes I've seen in both India and Pakistan, has become a very governance-based issue. And that came out a lot in uh, the policies that were being mentioned uh, throughout all of the presentations today. Pakistan has a lot of difficulty with territorial sovereignty and centralization of a local democratic government. Now, India, on the other hand, from the start, we talked about how uh, Pakistan started out as a Muslim country, whereas uh, India was starting out with very many different cultures from the moment that we kind of left this, inherited this British democracy and moved it into their own state building. Uh, in that way, I would say that India itself was a state nation rather than a nation state. There was a big push to try and uh, accommodate for various different cultures. This was the approach because you were left with several religions, 
people in very different regional identifications, people moving from um, you know, a large caste-based system. Um, what I bring that up is to talk a little bit about the BJP, since it was mentioned, and I think we can give a little bit more context for our discussion. Um, is that India, in a way, uh, had been following a policy of the state nation and started making more and more appeasement processes, appeasement policies within the government. You know, if you're of a certain religion, you can follow this and this, uh, these rules when it comes to accession of land. Whereas if you're from a different religion, you're subject to and governed by other rules. Uh, this movement of appeasement, as we often even see in the government in the US today, creates a tide that swung completely in the other way of populism that has arised for the Partha Janata Party, the Hindu uh, national government, to capitalize on scapegoating mechanisms. Now, a few months ago, uh, Professor Khan actually asked me to give a talk on has the rise of religious nationalism made Indian democracy more fragile? My main claim at that point was that India might at least be at its least fra at its least historically fragile right now because of its affirmed Hindu identity and economic progress that's being made. But that what's then contentious and very contentious is the fragility of democracy. Um, but Professor Khan did mention several tenets of democracy. I would mention a few others, and these are uh, defined by Larry Diamond, who's a professor at Stanford, so maybe that's my Stanford background. Uh, but one of the, the big tenets that Larry Diamond mentions is that a democracy in its ideal form should also have the protection of the human rights of it, all of its citizens equally measured. And I think that this is where we have a big question happening. If right now in India, uh, scapegoating a common enemy through cow vigilantism um, and the idea of development that becomes a spectacle, we start to wonder how long this goal of democracy or of its tenets, this protection of human rights of all its citizens, will be possible. Um, but then also in reifying the uni this unified country, how much more fragile or not are the borderlands? Um, so when we think about this, also the, the discussion of free movement and this idea that maybe we can open the borders for people to talk to one another, that Professor Sapoorthi brought up, what does that mean? Where is security fitting into that? Would there be a mass movements and migration from one place to another? Um, and you know, can we move out of this constant ideology where Pakistan is has the ideology of saying, well, we have to uh, uh, be the resistor of a Hindu India, and at the same time having him. Uh, uh, this Hindu India move past this idea that appeasement is a wrong approach. Um, so I think in, you know, this is some ideas to open up the discussion to really think forward of where does diaspora fit? How do we think of borders? Is SARC a useful mechanism? And how can we actually mobilize youth, a youth that's hungry? That would be my last statement, which is just that the youth that we see in India that's on the rise, it's not, also when we see that they're uh, conscripted, and maybe Vikram can back me up here with some empirical knowledge, there's also a kind of record in areas, there's record unemployment. And in a lot of areas, unemployment is something where if you, you have to belong to a political party. And what's the political party that's regionally in power? So if you're a farmer and you're out of work and you need to find, find a job and you're young, you may then join the party that's in power. So these are also some kind of concepts that are, that are at play that I would just say that in this idea that we are all one people, we're also all one people with a one world ideology, an idea that we all want to be part of this Facebook community. The fact that this is live streaming and someone in India can watch it today. My parents are watching it in Wisconsin right now. Um, but that also in this world of one world, we are also kind of living the same daily struggles. How do we live? How do we make, uh, make money? And, and I think that those are kind of some questions that need to be addressed when we're thinking of this larger macro picture of how India and Pakistan will find peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nipa. I'm not sure about the youth being hungry, but I just know the youth <laughs> from here. Well, I'm a hungry uh, youth. <laughs> there is, uh, something is wrong with my eyesight today, and normally I'm I seeing a book in his presentation, but I'm also seeing an edited volume on this panel, and I'm looking at you, Salim. <laughs> maybe, maybe we need to put together this book uh, or take this conversation further. It's too fascinating. Uh, we have 30 minutes, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm giving all the panelists papers in case they need to write something. So we will take comments, not comments, questions from the, from the house. And please raise your hand. We will take all the questions, and then at the end, I will invite the panelists to 
very briefly not shake hand or say mm, <laughs> or give brief answers. So I see, oh, you have to be very brief, especially, okay? The last time you just went on and on, I didn't even have the money to give you at that time. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three, four, five. I'll take this first five. So we'll start with the. Uh, <laughs> let me just run, all right? Okay. So who was. I called you one, right? One. Who did I call two? I, I, mine is a comment, so you, I'll take it later when you have time. Okay. Uh, no, then Zubair is two, and then Nassim Hassan is four, uh, Shahid, Rajwa, Maliksa. All right, we'll start with these people, and uh, go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Ed Carl, and I live in Bloomington. And my question is that I'd like to ask uh, the panelists all to comment on, on um, what's uh, becoming the, the new shape of the world, which is called the One Belt, One Road, which is a policy that China has put forward in the last several years. And this is revolutionizing relations among nations and the whole planet. And it's, of course, Americans don't know about it because our media pretends it doesn't exist. It's in denial. <laughs> So we had similar problems. We've had it in the U.S. as these, as you've had it in Asia, and it's part of part of it maybe because we inherited the common colonial past. And part of the problem of the colonial past was that the colonial mentality was that it did not promote economic progress. It kept didn't it was a, it was not promoting the development of the world economy. Therefore, we haven't solved the problems of poverty. In particular, which is a, which is really the most basic problem, if you can get people working together to solve that problem together, then they're working for a common future for their children, which is better than our generation had. So we have to look to the future. We have to build a world where there's economic development, and that means fusion energy has to be developed. It's been suppressed. It's it's a solution. We have to explore the universe. Mankind thank, does that because you, of the yeah. nature of humanity. So we don't want to. Be how does this, the universe right, now. How can you know this conflict be resolved. resolved by working together in one world for development? Okay. The impact of the new Silk Road. That's the question. Number two, Zubersa. I have a question for both of my learned professors. Professor Sovadi, yeah. how we can forget the wounds of partition? My two uncles were murdered, massacred by the Hindu master. When we migrated from Gurdaspur to Lahore. My second question to you is that you said that the, my, uh, what I am trying to tell you is that uh, if you look into the history of Indo Pak, people like Akbar the Great and Raja Ram Mohan Rai both try to bring the two uh, systems together, but they miserably failed. Then people like Guru Nanak and Kabir also tried to bring the two, two communities together, but they failed. The good things which are done by these leaders were forgotten, but the deeds of Aurangzeb and Shivdi still remain in the mind of all Hindu and So that's my... So for those of you who could not hear, the two-part question, the first one was how do we forget the atrocities committed during the partitions we lost our dear ones to violent and gruesome acts. And the second question was in spite of illustrious people who tried to bring the two communities together, we have not yet succeeded. Uh, who are we to do? Because if Akbar could not do it, how can we do it? Uh, the next speaker question is from Nasim Hassan, sir. Uh, it's a great topic. My understanding is yeah, no. first, you have to put the problems in perspective. What are the major problems? I listened to all of you and Vikram, and you mentioned, in my opinion, the first issue 
into Kashmir. If we eliminate all the one or two, then we can proceed towards peace. But my, one of the suggestion or comment is that we should work on the common issues. And I see the environment, the smog, the pollution of all the rivers in India and Pakistan, and the lack of clean drinking water, poverty. So we, if we have to look for peace, we have to look at the issues where we can commonly work together. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it, it, it's fascinating that Kashmir did not come up at all. So, so it, that is a problematic issue. Uh, the second comment is uh, that yes, why not encourage people to work on uh, shared problems, environment, pollution, Trump, common problem. <laughs> <laughs> Our next uh, question is from Shai Bhatt. Uh, I'm very happy to present in this kind of talk. I welcome everyone. It was a very nice talk. I enjoyed it. But uh, we love to have a closer relationship with India. The money we are spending on the arms to fight can be saved and put on use for the poverty. And my basic question, unless we solve the basic problem, which is Kashmir, and nowadays the killing is going on, women, children, everyone, every day, every day. You watch the news, even this come through the Indian uh, media too. So I would like to ask what Dr. Sanjay and other guests, what they think about this, how we can resolve this is the basic issue. <coughs> if Pakistan is attaching this condition before we go further, we have to solve this problem first. Thank you. Right, another question on Kashmir. Uh, <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for all scholars. I don't know what you are talking about because my English is not that strong, but I know you are talking good. <laughs> <laughs> but how can we go further up? Thanks God, we are living in the United States of America, which when they have 52 states together, and all the world is divided. So let us start from here. My question is this. If somebody say, somebody cook good food and that food stay at home and nobody have a marketing for that food, how the people know about the food or any garments? So thanks God we have American friends here, we have Indian brother, sister friends here and Pakistanis are there. So today, this is a good start, but that start go to the Washington. Now we fix the date. The Pakistani bring his ambassador and the UN ambassador here, and the Indian bring his ambassador, which one they talk and the people can listen. And American brother, I request for you or all other people, you bring Chris Cole, Jack Barker, Governor, or the media. So they talk and if they talk and they give to answer to each other, then you know what is the real story. Now if I am talking, Indians are bad, they are killing the Kashmiris. No. We are also problem creating in India as a Pakistani. This is a no good. Because our army, if he is sincere with the talk, so they can talk with the Indian politician. Where is the problem? Everybody want to come be a powerful person, big boss. So until we everyone come a big leader for only might is right, we cannot bring the peace. So next step, we want from the scholar, professor, how they can effort if they can bring in the first state is ambassador. I try my to do to help Pakistani people to bring our ambassador. Bring our Maliyaludi here, so the both party can talk in front of everyone. Then the people know who's right and who's wrong. Thank you very much. Uh, our challenge is very difficult. There are there are maybe three thousand Indians 
and 3,000 Pakistanis in Delaware, I can't bring them here. <laughs> Can you imagine trying to bring Everybody their ambassadors? But, uh, uh, but we, I will work with you on this, inshallah. This should be our target in the next one year to bring both the ambassadors, Thanks. minimum, inshallah. Both the ambassadors right here. What it is, Naveed? We are going to do that. Both the ambassadors right here. And if Chris Coons doesn't come, then we'll check him out in, in November. We'll remember in November. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, I also tried this once in D.C. There was this peculiar moment where the ambassador of Pakistan to the U.S. was Abida Hussain. And the pa ambassador from India to the U.S. was Abid Hussain. <laughs> I couldn't get Abid Hussain and Abida Hussain in the same room. It was so, so challenging. Can you imagine that? The only difference was an A. Uh, <laughs> but 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 that's that's the challenge of our times, uh, Kathleen. Um, I'm Kathleen Meyer, uh, co-founder with my colleagues in Lahore and Delhi of the Free Nation Delaware Lahore Delhi Partnership for Peace. Um, we have a very ambitious program over the years. Um, we bring ambassadors uh, from India, from Pakistan, and of course from our own State Department. And uh, we'll be resuming our spring schedule uh, in March. And if you'd like to be on our mailing list so you can attend, um, give me your business card at the end of this program. Um, we have uh, a very active uh, NGO in Delhi and in Lahore. We send delegations there every year and they come here. Uh, and uh, our programs also involve the educational series. Six high schools participate with over 2,700 high school students. It's their only exposure to South Asia, incredibly. These young people know absolutely nothing about India and Pakistan. <coughs> and it's a real wake up call. And they're very, very active in the question and answer series. And my colleague here at the podium has been involved in our organization from the outset. For those of you who don't know this, but the Big Sick has been nominated for Oscar. Uh, uh, it's a movie in which a Pakistani is starring. Uh, you have your hands up? Yeah. Go ahead. Quick question. After that, I'll come to you, Sadiq and Shari. Okay. okay. Um, so just putting it out there, I'm probably one of the few average Americans, not a scholar, not a medical person, not just a little old me who has been to Pakistan twice. If so, you've been to Pakistan twice and you're not in Guantanamo, you're not average. <laughs> I'm just, saying, just kidding. You have to be yes. a scholar everywhere to get money to go anywhere. And the group that we belong to, People for People International, is trying to bring people like me who are Kweenies to meet other Kweenies anywhere around the world so we get to see the truth and hear the truth. Um, but my, that's just a short comment. My big, quick question is why did nobody talk about the Olympics as being a way to bring the two countries together? Do you know anything about the teams yeah. or are they going to meet? Yeah, you should look at the Olympic records of the two countries and you'll know why we don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Delaware wins more medals than both the countries combined in their entire history. <laughs> All right. Uh, Shahid, I'll come to you since you're moving first. Go ahead, Shahid. Thank you very much. This was a very informative uh, topic. So I have a small question, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sonarvaji. Uh, as you said, uh, in the last 70 years, uh, um, uh, Pakistan has never had a religious government as such. Uh, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to declare Pakistan at Constitution, Secular State. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Sadiq. Peace and greetings to all. Uh, I wanted to make more on a uh, comments, a couple of them. I think we should. Thanks, Mustafa. I think we should have a pathway approach to negotiation or co uh, meeting with the other country. Basically, like Professor said, that you know we should have at the government level, we should have at the people level, and at the common man level. And I'm thinking that why don't we take a page from North Korea and South Korea in a different way. You know, have a zone between the borders that is open, just like NAFTA, SAFTA, where people come from both countries, have trade, have a recreational place, things like that, a zones that are created across the border, where it is outside the political zone, everything, so people can buy, trade, sell, and absolutely that would change the demographics. The other thing is that, 
I think like US is struggling or trying to understand the senior citizen or the people who are getting 55 and above, the population is increasing. I think exactly the opposite zone, India and Pakistan are dealing with the youth. And I'm pretty sure the politicians and people like me, including me, 70s, 80 years, have never seen this phenomenon, do not have a clue about how to resolve. I think that would be a phenomenon because if they don't have a way to pathway to channel these resources of the youth and the mind, I am telling you it will be a new nightmare that they're going to be because people will be all over the place because that is the highest majority of people that are there in the both countries. And the finally I wanted to say is to Dr. Salim Ali's statement that informed democracy is good but I think we need to add another word called conscience here. So we need to be conscious about our society, our neighbors and everything. That is the act. Uh, democracy that is going to survive in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Sadiq. Uh, we already have that zone. It's called the USA. The no Indians man. and Pakistanis yeah, get together. That's why it's called the Nobel yeah. Land. Well, it's yeah. up and then we will... Now I'd like to make a comment because I've been seeing it. Very good talk, big talk, big, big ambitions. But I have seen here in Delaware there are Indian organizations, there are Pakistani organizations, there are Muslim organizations, there are Hindu organizations. How much efforts do we put together? That we get together with each other, we start from the you know, ground level and see, because look, I'm mean, today here, I got emails from the both, you know, like Indian as well as from Pakistanis, Muslims and Hindus both. I'm very much involved with all these organizations, but I hardly see any Muslims coming in temple. I don't know, maybe you don't want to you know, get into religion, but they have got a lot of activities. They are, you know, trying to bring in a community, community together. And I've heard the word, you know, if it's a temple, I will never go. I've heard the same way. There are many things happen, and I invite, you know, when I talk about mosque, there are a lot of resistance. So why don't we start here first at the ground level and see but how we can bring all of us, you know, all this young generation, old generation, I'm old man, but all generations to bring together and see what we can do. We should try. This is the beginning. We tried this year. Alhamdulillah, it's a success. And so I hope this will, we can build on this initiative. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give three to five minutes to each of the distinguished guests. And... Uh, the rest of the panelists, if you want to make comments or responses, you're welcome. We we'll try to wrap it up in 15 minutes before the biryani or to get cold. Okay? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'm not going to respond all the questions. What I have in my mind, I, will, I think that that would be the response of all the questions altogether. Wow. Okay. What uh, what Kasmi, uh, Orange, Akbar, Mondra, and all that issues have come? My I mentioned in my presentation status quo. What is my point? Is that maintain status quo. And in fact, one should learn. Don't behave like a soft power. Don't behave like a hard power. Be smart power. Be smart power like China. I tell you, very interesting. We had rivalries with China. India and China from 1962. We did not even have the embassies and consulate. In 1988, we had come together and we have adopted a policy, particularly China had adopted a policy of engagement. We will engage, but we will maintain a status quo. What do you mean? That on border issues, whatever dispute is there, we will maintain a status quo. No firing, nothing. We will maintain whatever is there. And we will we will engage ourselves economically, trade. You can see that what, how much trade India and China has now, more than $72 billion trade that India and China has too. So we have to maintain the status quo, don't go with whatever is there, accept whatever the status quo is there. Then you can go, you can reach on peace process, you can come link to communities, maintain, try to bring engagement between the two communities, two states on other issues uh, on that. Number two, so I'm not going in detail. Number two, very good 
question she has asked about the resource sharing uh, uh, from uh, resource nationalism to uh, resource sharing. The so best example is from her country, Bangladesh. Today, India and Bangladesh is sharing the resources. What are the resources? That Bangladesh was never agreed from 1965 to till date, they were never agreed to give the transit to India. Now we have started sharing the resources. Bangladesh has agreed, yes, you can use the territory of Bangladesh to reach to northeastern states and we will we will use Indian territory to go to Nepal and Bhutan. We have started sharing our resources. Now we have the power corridors. Now we have the transit corridors. We have started. We are sharing, we are giving developments. Bangladesh is the largest recipient of the soft loan from India. More, more than $8 billion had been given by India to <coughs> Bangladesh to develop the infrastructures. What would happen? The two countries will prosper. Now we have developed the developmental, we have the developmental board and we are developing together. We are bringing prosperity in the Eastern South Asia regions. So my simple submission is that in Pakistan also we should adopt the same approach. If India can bring natural gas and energy from Central Asian countries through, Bang uh, through Pakistan, that would definitely prosper to Pakistan because it will have transit fee and all that. And economic dependencies will increase. The security strait will increase. When India will have the gas pipeline through Pakistan, Indian security interest will increase in that. No, we need a stable Pakistan. We need a prosper Pakistan. We should cooperate with Pakistan. In the same manner, Pakistan will also be prosper when they will use Indian territory for uh, trade and uh, other purposes. My point is that if, if that thing would come, the resource sharing uh, agreements or a, a mindset would come. I think this region would, uh, would would come. All these problems of Aurangzeb and, and and religion and partisans and and uh, we are we are teaching. Uh, you know, we are going with all these things. And many of the questions had been answered by uh, Dr. Salim Ali of mine. What was India in 1947 and why their radicalizations have been taken place. Uh, till date. So I'm not going uh, much into uh, into uh, the, these details and if we will again will go with all these kinds of discourse that we will radicalize our youth generations and that would uh, that would further distance the two communities, two people and two countries. Thank you very much. And the resources, uh, one, one question, and the resources distribution you said between India and Bangladesh, there is a very big uh, resource with the Brahmaputra River, which yeah. India and Bangladesh should share equally. We are saying, don't, you don't know that. <coughs> you don't know about, That's why listen, you it. don't know because in Brahmaputra, China has become the concern for India and Bangladesh. And we are we have signed uh, we have we are sharing Ganges Water Treaty. Thirty years very successfully, uh, we have signed a treaty and now it's implemented. There are very small issues. We have resolved border issues, land boundary agreements. We have signed in 2015. Almost all the issues. We do not talk about migration between when two countries are uh, two states uh, uh, meeting together. We have come out almost whatever it was before 1947 or whatever it was before 1965. I wish Bangladesh, uh, I wish India and Pakistan also come out. No, we have a corridor. Huh? China is building a corridor from uh, all the way from to you are, Bangladesh. You are upsetting so, us. Oh, there is a corridor. You can Please. talk to him in the afterwards. Yeah. Go ahead. Should I proceed? Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> Right, uh, I am taking uh, uh, some of these questions one by one. First thing one belt one wrote, uh, the fear that I expressed in my presentation that uh, SARC is not uh, uh, that, that not productive. Uh, probably it will be one belt one road project that will bring together 62 countries and all of them will be linked with each other by road and maybe that would be the time when all these region, regional disputes uh, will be resolved because there will be an economic pressure upon them to resolve that. Uh, 
uh, one of the solutions of Kashmir dispute uh, that we talk about in Pakistan is that that uh, open uh, trade between the two countries and it would be their business community that will pressurize respective governments to go for a solution of this problem once and for all. As is the case right now, you have seen uh, between China and, pa and United States so many differences between them, but they cannot uh, uh, detach themselves and the reason is economics. Uh, 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 how to forget wounds of partition, um, yeah, uh, it's very difficult really for uh, the generation of, uh, uh, for, for your generation, but things are changing, things are changing. Uh, the gen younger generation, they are more interested in resolution of uh, yeah, the I problems rather than... My parents. I was born in Pakistan. I fully agree with you. And yeah. they shall continue. My kids will still hate Indian. I must say that and I the am. Americans are still hating you. I must say that my parents have migrated from India. They were from. They are from Shahanpur, and uh, all the kids they are right now talking about look to the future, look forward, speak about India as an independent sovereign state, accept it, and definitely Pakistan is a country that has already been established. I spoke about that. Uh, Akbar was not in its standard really that he wanted to bring Hindus and Muslims together. We are bringing them together. We want to resolve problems. But this time the standards are different. This time it is not religion. It is economics that will change the destiny of this region. Kashmir dispute I just spoke about. Uh, uh, about Kashmir I have a very bold statement really. And I, this can pre pre sometimes uh, this, it, it, may cre it creates problems for me as well. The solution to the Kashmir problem is uh, the problem. Yes. If it remains problem, that is probably the solution. I'm quite, I'm, I'm, I'm really very, very skeptical about its solution. I think its problem will serve the interests of the two countries. And this is what is happening. Uh, people are dying in Kashmir. Well, of, co of course, yes, uh, that has been happening in different parts of India. But uh, the question is uh, how Pakistan or India are responding to it. I think well, Pakistan has given numerous solutions to the problem, but they are not responding to that. And so is the case from Indian side. They have also sp spoken about a uh, few things. We say that uh, re resolution of problems will start from Kashmir, and they say it will start from, uh, uh, from dealing with terrorism. And uh, that has become, once again, an egoistic issue. Uh, if Pakistan, if no Isla go Islamic government uh, has been established in Pakistan, and, and uh, no Islamic party government has done, why not to declare Pakistan as a secular? Remember that Islam is the basis of uh, Pakistan. It is... Uh, the, 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 the slogan upon which it, this country was produced. Uh, let me give you another example then. India is, uh, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was created as a secular state. If BJP is uh, coming over in government for the third time, should it be declared a Hindu nationalist state? <laughs> of course not, of course not, because that is something, the basis of uh, the, pro, the, the creation of that state. Islam is official religion of the country. Of course, the maximum population is Muslim, and they are adhering to it like that. However, they are not that extremist that any Islamic party will come into government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Uh, just a few. Or should I come up? Or yes. Okay. Uh, just a few quick points uh, on Kashmir. I would say that uh, there is a way out, and uh, it really does require third-party mediation. Even though both countries say that they will not uh, agree to third-party mediation, if I look at other disputes of this kind, um, whether it, it was um, in the case of uh, the East Timor situation with Indonesia, uh, they have all required some kind of a third-party process. And the only way possible is for um, uh, the international community to exert pressure on both sides to accept such a prospect. Uh, that may, if, if that doesn't happen, I agree uh, with uh, Professor Sorberthy that it will just go on unfortunately perpetuating. Um, and it may end up being in a situation where there's a low level of conflict, but both countries are still able to come to some kind of an agreement. Um, so I think but the problem is that Pakistan has made Kashmir a precondition for peace. Uh, I see that as a problem in Pakistan. I, I think Pakistan has to move beyond making Kashmir resolution a precondition to peace overall. 
Um, but it has become such a strong part of the national identity right now that I don't see a way out that Pakistan will actually back off from that. So uh, then the only other option is a third party process. On the environmental diplomacy side, someone brought that up. That's an area I work on a lot. You know, you were saying, let's work on air pollution issues and so on. Uh, th there is an effort across both countries to do that. Uh, there, there are processes underway which have looked at, like for the dengue fever situation, when uh, there, there was an epidemic in Pakistan, uh, you know, there was actually exchange between both Punjabs and both sides, East and West Punjab, uh, around uh, containment of the disease and looking at best practices. So that does happen. The problem I have as, you know, a scholar of sort of environmental diplomacy is how, how do we bring the low politics cooperation to the high politics cooperation? Because that low level happens. I mean, there's a lot of that, actually. People are saying, let's get people to meet and sports and all. That has been happening for 70 years in some form. It has decreased recently. But how do we elevate that so that it actually leads to greater peace? Um, you know, that's the real challenge. And uh, I think that for that to happen, you do need what we call track 1.5 processes, which is like you bring in some people who are actually in government and who can call the shots as well as the civil society groups and all. So not just track one, because track one, then you have the NSA problem that all the, just the military people are talking, and not just track two, where you have retired generals going to fancy hotels and having, oh yes, we shall make peace, which they have been ad nauseum, State Department has funded so many of those retired generals from India and Pakistan writing papers together, we will solve Siachen, we will solve this, and it, it hasn't happened. We have to get to track 1.5. On Siachen is a classic example which could be resolved so fast on environmental grounds. More people die of hypothermia in Siachen than bullets. But, and both countries are spending a million dollars a day keeping soldiers up there, but they, they are willing to do it because there hasn't been the political capital invested. That's a classic one which could be resolved through environmental diplomacy. So maybe we could even that symposium you might have with the ambassadors. Let's keep it simple and maybe focus on an issue like Siachen which is very resolvable. And in fact, both countries had come up with a peace plan. Uh, and at the last minute, and this just came out in the memoir from the Indian Foreign Secretary at the time, he has admitted that at that point, it was not the Indian, uh, the Pakistani army would stop the process. It was the Indian National Security Advisor and General um, Singh, the, the head of the armed forces in India, he, the, uh, the Lieutenant General from Pakistan was in Delhi to sign the peace agreement. And at the last moment, General Singh said, no, we will not do it. So it's, it's also very important that the US uh, population understand both militaries are to blame, Indian and Pakistani. It's the military industrial complex, which is a problem. General Eisenhower warned us of that in the US. So it's, it's important that we not just have hold one country to blame, both are to blame in this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. I, I, I want to respond to you. I, I was in a dialogue between President Bill Clinton and Khadi Hussain, who was the leader of Jamaat Islami. Uh, and then the very next day, I had an opportunity to actually spend more than two hours with uh, Benazir Bhutto. The issue was Kashmir, and it was very interesting. Uh, uh, Clinton just opened the dialogue by saying, I have a solution, and the solution is we take the LOC and that's it. The LOC is the final solution. And the most stunning aspect of this, uh, not, I hope I'm not, I don't think the meeting was classified anyway. So the most stunning aspect of this was that uh, Khadi Hussain accepted that but was unwilling to go on the, in, uh, on the record to say that. And when he said that, well this, he said that about an hour and a half into the meeting. When he said that, Clinton simply got up and walked out. And I ran literally after him, and then there were three, four of us running after him, saying what happened. He said, if he's not able to commit publicly to any solution, then there is no solution. Uh, so it was fascinating to me to, to watch that there were also representatives of the Kashmiri side in that meeting. And apparently, that is the solution. When I said in the beginning that there is no agreed upon there, there is a there there, which is to, to just finalize status quo and move on, and move on to more pressing issues such as cutting defense budget, investing in fighting poverty and environmental security. Uh, and since in the last five, six years, the United States looks at both countries through different lenses. 
It looks at Pakistan through the lens of terrorism and looks at India through the lens of China. So when the US looks at these two regions, it's not looking through the same lens. The point I'm trying to make is that it's going to be very difficult for the US to become the peace broker. In fact, the US is now not a credible peace broker anywhere. But as far as South Asia is concerned, uh, I'm not very sure that uh, uh, the US is currently interested in pushing this, this process. So that some initiative will have to come from somewhere else. And neither is Europe interested, so I think the only place is the diaspora and us. Well, let me um, I just wanted to make, uh, related to diaspora actually, one quick comment. Uh, to add on uh, One Road, One Belt, uh, it is very interesting that um, India sort of, with, with regard to Pakistan, my argument would be that there's sort of a status quo maintained in order to focus energy on the India-China rivalry of development. And so that's been very interesting because there's already been development projects of Chinese uh, investment in Pakistan right now. Um, but I hope that this idea that, um, or maybe the Silicon Valley idea that there's that uh, industry will be the great equalizer. So once these businesses come in, that there's a kind of product market fit will be good. But it seems like right now it's spreading more fodder for this kind of dissent between the India-Pakistan rivalry because of the India-China rivalry. Um, but with that being said, I noticed that 40% of the comments, uh, so four out of the 10, uh, that would be Kathleen, Miss Average American, the last comment, as well as a comment from Sir over here, uh, were all related to starting from the ground up and moving forward. I wanted to just point out one thing that I had forgotten to mention, which and came out from your comments, which is that I haven't heard of anyone taking on a South Asian identity except for South Asian Americans who are very clear about saying that they are South Asian Americans. Uh, so the power of the diaspora, the diaspora was really important in the last Indian elections, but there's something about what it means to be South Asian that we learn in being in the diaspora. And I think um, when you said, made your comment about, about being an average American, I thought, you know what? This is the first time in a very long time, I'm not even talking about the last election, I'm talking about when I went to work for Nancy Pelosi in 2004 in DC, that I said, this is an America that I want to live in, with all of you who are here building your own ideas and coming together. So I do think there is something to be said about if average Americans are going to Pakistan twice in a lifetime, um, and uh, uh, thinking of themselves as being part of a South Asia, I think that, that that kind of ideology is something that we want to build, and that's the sort of one world that I think will counter this kind of long-standing hatred between one another. We were having a debate about <laughs> teaching South Asian studies and whether to include Afghanistan in it or not. Yeah. In the United States, we don't include Afghanistan. But I wanted to tell you that I do use include Canada in South Asia <laughs> when I teach South Asian studies. So I do spend at least three, four days talking about Canada, which I think is part of it. We have a Saudaji for a defense minister now. It's high time we talked about it. Uh, I do not want to open a second round from the panelists, but there was one pressing uh, comment that Sanjay wanted to make, so I thought I would relate him and then invite uh, other president of the Masjid, uh, Bajwa Saab, to close the meeting with a dua. He said that if you talk about Kashmir and India's role in Kashmir, then it also opens to talking about terrorism and Pakistan's role in sponsoring terrorism in India. We talk about Mumbai attacks. You can't talk about Mumbai attacks. Attacks on India's parliaments, attacks on temples in India, and so on and so forth. And for those who are looking forward uh, uh, and prospects for peace, uh, those kind of dialogues are not very beneficial. So thank you very much for being such wonderful participants. I think we have accomplished a lot today, especially uh, since people all over the country and all over the world will be watching this. I invite you all to share this uh, dialogue with all your friends and others and keep demanding sending emails, not to me, to Naveed, <laughs> saying, <laughs> harassing, saying, when are the two ambassadors coming down to Masjid Isa? And we will also give you his email address to <laughs> Mr. Malik Awan's address, harass him also. But inshallah, we will host it. Dr. Uh, Shahid Bhargav, can you please do the dua and close meeting, please? Thank you very much, Dr. Mutul Khan, and I also thank and appreciate coming all my uh, guests from everywhere, from Dr. Sohavardi, uh, Dr. Sanjay, the sister from Bangladesh, and 
of this brother, Dr. Uh, Professor Salim. And uh, uh, this is, the, I, I think this is the, the point, uh, point from bottom. We start from the bottom and maybe one day we'll see the light end of the tunnel. And we sit together and, and enjoy each other food and talk. Inshallah. And I pray uh, for that. And we are, uh, uh, I thank you very much for uh, coming here and joining us for this event. On Masjid uh, Isa Bihar, we are trying to make this place a uh, welcoming place and um, for a future event, open for everyone. And uh, we will enjoy that. Uh, we will also discuss um, local, international, national issues. And uh, I hope we will see you again, inshallah, in the near future. And I would uh, like to acknowledge the uh, coming uh, for uh, Attorney General candidates, uh, Tim, Chris, Talisha, if I pronounce right, I'm sorry. Talisha? La La Karisha. La La and, and Chris, you know. And uh, if I forget Kathy. something, please forgive Kathy. me. And, and we look forward and another Kathy. room. And Kathy. and Kathy. I'm right here. Thank you, Kathy. Sorry for that. So we look forward to another event to, to talk with you uh, about uh, the perfect uh, law. Uh, I, your idea, want to know your idea about the um, perfect laws and order for the Delaware. And we welcome you and we look forward to you again. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day. Okay, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, that we are in His place under one roof. So Allah make us easy to come understand each other and love each other. Mm -hmm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand according to his blessing that how we treat each other and we respect each other's religion. And Allah help us to sit together and talk together and um, eat together. Yeah, I also mentioned we have food over here anyway. <laughs> And whatever our uh, countries need to be done, and uh, Allah help us to uh, uh, understand our politician, you know, not involve the personal issues and personal wishes, and don't make us fight with each other and sit together, inshallah. And one day we will sit together, inshallah. Thank, Thank you very much. You. So we have for the food now? Yeah. Yes. How, how are you going to do this? Can we have two lines? Uh, no. no just, all right. We have to form a line there and grab some food, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very
ऐसी है कि 500-500 किलोमीटर है आपका बॉल गेंद कितने का है ये काम है सर